Since 1958, about 220,000 Colombians have been killed because of internal armed conflict in the country. 80% were civilians. Approximately 27,000 citizens have been kidnapped and about 25,000 are still missing. This is more than double of the total desaparecidos in Paraguay, Chile, and Argentina during the 1970s. There have been reports of about 1,700 victims of sexual abuse and approximately 14,000 teenagers have been recruited by force by guerrilla groups and paramilitaries. Eighty-five percent of municipalities in the country had suffered military combat. In most of them, non-conventional weapons were used. It is estimated that in 447 municipalities, that is 45% of the total, there are anti-personal mines <coughs> that could remain active for about 20 years. About 1,000, 10,000 people, among men, <coughs> women, and children, have suffered some sort of mutilation because of this kind of mines. 38% were civilian. <coughs> Almost 6 million people have been displaced by force from their hometown. If we put them together, we will have the second largest city in the country after Bogota, which is the capital. These are the facts, some of the facts, of the conflict, the Colombian internal armed conflict during the last half a century. I think most of Colombians, uh, we have been in touch very near and lost uh, people <coughs> close to us during this conflict. 
Fortunately, as you may know, we finally reached a peace agreement. That started four years ago, the initial conversation on September the 4th, 2012, and ended on November 24th last year. As you may know, this peace agreement was put to a referendum the 2nd of October last year, and uh, the slight majority said no to that agreement. Only 35% of the Colombians actually went to vote, 35%. That obliged the government to go again to the peace agreement, uh, review that, involved most of the people who were against that particular agreement, and produce a new one. That new one was, was taken to the Parliament, and in last December they approved that. So, now, we are starting a new era in Colombia, that is called the post-conflict phase. That, I'm sure, will take many years, in which we have all Colombians together trying to build a new Colombia to dream a new country in peace. The agreement was based in four principles. The first one is truth seeking. It's quite important after this kind of conflict to know what happened and why it happened. To know where the separatists are, why they were killed, and where the bodies are located. The second one is justice. The third one is reparation. People who actually commit some sort of crime, they have to repair what they did to the victims. And finally, the assurance of no repetition. So the government and the people in Colombia have to, we have to work for finding all the different causes and relationships in order for this kind of conflict not to become again in the next years. So they have been developing a set of programs directed to victims, the guerrilla groups and the paramilitary. This is the socio-political context of the program we started about 10 years ago. And uh, what we want to do is to share with you the story of that program. Many people have been taking part of that development, and it is still under development. A huge number of people have come together. We have run seminars, workshops, political negotiations, research, and so on. I think it is a nice example of systemic thinking <coughs> and social cybernetics in action. Although I'm not going to show the particular conceptual framework or methodological tools we used, I think that is all in the background. I want to concentrate in the story in itself. <coughs> but this story that we're going to listen to didn't happen in the chronological order I wanted to, I chose to tell it. Um, but anyway, I have to choose one order. But please keep that in mind. From all the people who actually have been participating in the project, I wanted to mention that one, Professor Eduardo Aldana, uh, who has been quite active from the beginning 10 years ago. He's now an emeritus professor in the Universidad de los Andes and was the president of Universidad de Ibagué where I was the vice president uh, until last year. That all happened or began 
uh, began in a small region of Colombia that is called Tolima, one of the states. It's in the center of the country with a population of 1.3 million and an area of 2,300 square kilometers, 47 municipalities, and they have, we have all the planets. In all the south part of Tolima were the place where the guerrilla was born. And most part of the conflict had taken place precisely in that area. Three years ago, in the capital of the state, in Ibagué, where we have our home, we had uh, organized WASP 2016. And some of you actually went there and uh, knew parts of this uh, beautiful place in Colombia. We have 40 rivers just inside the state. That's Bull River born and died in that part of the country. We have a beautiful landscape, a huge biodiversity. But as a usual paradox in some of our Latin American countries, we have poor people living in a rich territory. 57% of uh, people from Tolima live under the poverty line. So 10 years ago, we started with Eduardo and a group of people to um, guide the process in order to build up a common vision, like a common dream of the development of the department. So we got together with uh, hundreds of people, about 60 different institutions, the local government, the regional government, the Chamber of Commerce, entrepreneurs, people from the uh, biggest companies, the three universities, the public ones and the private ones, and start a process that took us two years. At the end of that, we agree on three things. Outcomes that we wanted to share in the 2025 regarding development. We wanted to have an economic growth of the state regarding his position to the country. But at the same time, we, have, we wanted to reduce poverty. And at the same time, we have to do, we want to do that in an equity term. That means that the distribution of wealth were more equal among the people. And we want to reach all the three outcomes at the same time. We also agreed in three principles. The first one, to, de to develop the country thinking in development center on the people. Sustainable development and an equilibrium between urban development and rural development. And finally, we agree to do things, programs, to promote three main values and a spirit of entrepreneurship among the people, especially young ones, solidarity, and active citizenship. Again, all together. Along with this vision, we started to develop some programs and projects. Interesting enough, that was done in 2005, almost 11 years ago. In the state, we have about three different political governments, governors, from three different political parties. But all of them have incorporated this vision inside their own um, development program. Two years ago, the vision itself was reviewed 
and this new reviewed vision that maintained the same uh, outcomes, principles, and values were incorporated as part of the political um, agenda for the General Assembly of the state. What the problem was for us? Well, in Tolima, we had about 110 young people between 17 and 21 year old that cannot get into higher education, despite all have been graduated from, from high school. That happened in the small municipalities around the country, around the state. So what these young people can actually do as their future? Well, they can get a low-income job, or they can move to large cities, or they can join the guerrilla groups, or they can join a legal drug producers. But nowadays, because we have sent a peace process, they don't even have this choice. So what they can actually do for their lives? In Colombia, if we increase the age range from 17 to 31 years old, we have about 8 million of these people. <laughs> All of them graduated from high school, but with almost no possibility of going further into higher education. Mm -hmm. Mainly, they are living in rural areas. So that was our focus population. So what can we do with them? With them, not for them. So remember, we have. 8,000 former guerrilla members that now are going to be demobilized in the following months. And many of the programs that the government has developed are directed to them. But what happened, what could happen with the 8 billion youngsters that have no access to higher education in rural areas? That was the question we were addressing. If we do nothing about them, probably they will be the origin, the genesis of new ways of violence in Colombia. So we have to take charge of that. Take care of that. We found that food production it was a great opportunity. Why? Because According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, by 2050, we need to double food production to cope with global demand. And in Colombia, we had about 2 million hectares that could be actually used for food production. They have not been used precisely because of the violence. What happened with traditional farming in the Tolima and many of the states in Colombia? Well, after 52 years of violence, what we have now is old farmers, poorly educated, using traditional agricultural practices. And at the same time, we have young boys graduated from high school willing to leave their hometown. This is an actual graphic that you can show the number of people moving out the rural areas and moving towards the cities and the opposite as well. If you add to that figure the number of people that has been this side by force, this gap is becoming bigger. 
water could be the challenge. To take the small traditional and independent formats and transform them by using technological innovation into associations of technologically improved food factories. So we are making a distinction between independent farmers and a group of food factories using as a transformation tool the technological innovation in the production process. In order to do that, we started by looking synergies between the higher education systems in Colombia and local production processes in the municipalities. And what we did was to start to develop, to develop technological programs, three years technological programs, using a dual model that was an adaptation of the model we found in Germany. Here, the students learn by doing and reflecting upon their practices at the same time. But they were paid while they are studying. So we start to develop these sort of programs. Take, for example, traditional fish farming. I took that example because Tolima is the second <coughs> national producer in the country of fish. But if you look at the traditional process, what we have is this. We have the river, one of the many that are in the state. And what people do is that uh, to take a diversion of the river, they clean water to produce a pond, you say, and to put fish there to start growing them, and then the water goes back, dirty water, because of the fish, to the river. And that's the traditional way of doing that. We start to move to aquaponic. What is it? Well, we found that technology in Germany, so we went there in Germany and start learning how they do that. This is a diagram to explain the process. Now you don't have fishes into ponds, you have fishes into tanks. And in a tank you have control of uh, the food you put in, the turbulence of the water, the amount of water, the level of oxygen, and so on. So after a while, they took the water from the tank and um, passed this water to some filters and used that filtered water to grow hydroponics. And then you take this water from the hydroponics plant, filter that again, and put it back into the water with the tanks, with the fishes. So in that cycle, you actually use, reused 95% of the water. So only 5% of this water just go as waste. That was done in the Leibniz Institute near Berlin, where we went, and we start uh, uh, a process to do a technological transfer from the institute to uh, Universidad de Ibagué in uh, Tolima. This is actually one actual picture of what they have in the institute. So what we have now is that the university developed a dual technological program for the people in the municipalities. And uh, those people become agents for doing the, transfer the technological transformation of the traditional farms into food fabrics. In this case, using the aquaponic technology. 
And then we started also at the same time to run different workshops in order to organize those associations, bringing in big companies, supermarkets, and uh, to develop between them an inclusive business model. In this kind of modeling business, the farmers are not seen as simple providers, but they are part, they are partners of the whole business. So we have fair trading, the quality of the food increases, the technology improves as well, and the supermarkets who buy the food, they buy it at a reduced price because they don't have to go through different change of, uh, how do you call it? Uh, supply chain. Supply chain. Suppliers, it's a change. The people just go to the <laughs> farmer, buy, and then we buy, we build, we sell that and so on. It's a chain of suppliers. So we cut out these videos. That was the word. I was looking for the word. We also developed an institutional set of that. We developed with Eduardo an Institute for Regional Innovation. It's called INNOVAR, Institute for Regional Innovation. That is located in one of the municipalities. It's called Purificación. Purification is the name of the municipality, because Eduardo was born there. This institution has three main primary activities. The first one is to deliver dual technological programs to the people in the municipality. The second primary activity is to identify local production processes who can actually be improved by using innovation technology. And the third one, the third one is to develop local community capabilities in the population, so they can start taking care of their own life. Those are the three main primary activities of the institution. That institution was set 10 years ago. The aim is to develop a network of those institutions and the state, 20 in the virus connected like that. This is a picture of some of the youngs that have been graduated in those programs last year. We have graduated about 3,000 of those people in purification so far. So, let me put together all these pieces of the puzzle. And again, what I'm going to show doesn't happen in that chronological order, but this is one way to make sense of that. So we have the people, the students, the youngsters, teenagers in municipalities. We have the university, a local university who coordinate with the INNOVAR. The INNOVAR is actually located in the municipality. They deliver the technological programs using the dual model. The local government creates a fund in the ISETEX. ISETEX is a national institution dedicated to give loans to students. For each dollar the local government put, the ISETEX put another one. And this fund is used to finance 75% of the education of the students. The students and the families have to take care of the 25%. They also get a salary while they are studying. The German government uh, made an agreement with the Colombian Ministry of Justice in order to start a program on crops substitution of drugs. 
that is important because drug production, one of the main finance um, activities of the guerrilla group after the cartel drugs were destroyed in the 1980s. The Ministry of Justice created the fund with the aim of the regional government and that fund was put in the Commerce Chamber of Ibagi. The Leibniz Institute in Germany started a process of technology transfer to the University of Ibagi. So the university will start to produce the technology that is needed for the aquaponic uh, process to start working. Then the university will deliver the technology to the local farms. The students will act as transforming agents using that technology in order to transform the local farms to technologically improved food production companies. We made an agreement with the senior expert services that is located in Germany in order to coach tutors in the Innovar. Those tutors are uh, working with the students in the transformation process. They help local farmers to develop their own capacities to make this transformation, to become a food fabric where the students start to work and then they start to pay back their loans. They start to organize with similar to get associations of food producers, which in itself start to provide new tutors to the education program. The regional government defined and put in place tax incentives to attract supermarkets to the local communities, to the region. And those supermarkets start to develop inclusive models with the association of food producers. And this is the whole picture of the system. What we have now is that Many parts of the system is working. Not the whole system is itself articulated. This is designed for a particular municipality right now, purification, in a particular production process, fishing. And we start to look at another productive processes in the same municipality and move up to other municipalities to scale up the whole system. So you can see agents, institutions at different levels. At the local level, at the regional level, the national and the international level. That's the story I wanted to share with you. Thank you.